Good evening, True Vine Church family, friends, and guests. I am Brother Michael Young, your moderator for tonight. On behalf of Bishop Trevor Alexander and Overseer Emma Alexander, we would like to welcome you to our Black History Month program. Black History Month celebrates the achievement and significant contributions of African Americans and our fundamental role in shaping the history of our nation. It is also a time of reflection on the struggles for freedom and equal opportunity. As we continue to excel and break barriers for the next generation, let us never forget our history and our ancestors who paved the way forward for us. This year, our theme is the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity. The sequence of events for tonight are opening prayer by Faith William, scripture reading by Lenara Johnson, and the introduction of the theme by Sister Sharon Gary, Followed by our panel discussion and closing remarks from Bishop Treble and Overseer Emerald Alexander. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy our program. Let's get started with prayer. Um, good afternoon, church. My name is Faith, and I'll be praying. Please bow your head and close your eyes. Lord, thank you for getting us through this snowstorm and keeping us safe. Lord, help us to realize that Black History Month is all of our history. And just because our skin color or our race, no one needs to get treated differently. I pray that the year of 2021 and so forth, that our Black History Month will keep educating others and people our generation gets bigger. Lord, please keep us safe and let them know that you are walking with them every step of the way. And open our minds so we can learn something new from the speaker this afternoon. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I love it. Next, we have the scripture reading. Good evening. My name is Lanai Johnson. The Bible tells us the family is one of the most important things in life. The Bible makes this plain in the creation account where God makes a woman and a man, unites them as one flesh and blesses them with exhortation to be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, Genesis 2, 23 and 24. It revisits the theme in Deuteronomy 11, 19 and Proverbs 22 and 6, where the Lord instructs his people to train up their children in the way of holiness and truth. It underscores the message in the psalmist's declaration that children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, the reward. Psalm 127, 3. It emphasizes it in the apostle psalm warning that if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, 1 Timothy 5, 8. For all of these reasons, we do not hesitate to affirm that there is a strong biblical basis for focusing on the family. This evening, our focus will be on the family. Thank you, and may God continue to pour his blessings upon you and your family. Amen. Hey, Brother Young. Yes, sir. If you give me a favor, let me make a quick announcement that okay. this is going to be on Facebook Live. For those of you who have tried to uh, chime in to the Zoom page, please log off and go onto Facebook. This is just for the panels to be on Zoom. So once you finish your part, we just ask you to log off and let the panels, the panelists be listed. Thank you all. All right, back in your hands, Brother Young. Okay. Okay, Sister Sharon. Good evening, my name is Sharon Gary. Uh, I want to talk about or give the introduction on the Black family. I'd like to give honor to Bishop Trevor, Overseer Emmer, and all the panelists and guests. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on our annual Black History event. The Black family has been a topic of study in many disciplines, literature, the visual arts and film studies, sociology, anthropology, and social policy. Its representation, identity, and diversity have been reverenced, stereotyped, and vilified for the days of, from the days of slavery to our own time. The Black family knows no single location since family reunions and genetic ancestry searches testify to the spread of family members across states, nations, and continents. Not only are individual Black families diasporic, but Africa and that diaspora itself have long been portrayed as Black family as large. While the role of the Black family has been described by some as a micro, microcosm of the entire race, 
Its complexity as the foundation of the African-American life and history can be seen in numerous debates over how to represent its meaning and typicality from the historical perspective as a slave or free, as patriarchal, matriarchal, and matrifocal, as single-headed or dual-headed household, as extended or nuclear, as fictive kin, blood, lineage, as legal or common law, and as black or interracial. Variation appears as well in discussions on the nature and impact of parenting, childhood, marriage, gender norms, sexuality, incarceration. The family offers a rich tapestry of images for exploring the American, African-American past and present. And as we explore our history, let us not forget where we came from, but also have a path to where we will go next. Thank you. Okay, uh, now in this time we will go into our panel discussion. I will ask each one of the panel members to introduce themselves so that the audience can kind of get a feel of who you are. Start with uh, Bishop. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all of the panelists that have gathered here today. Um, for those of you, I am Bishop Trev Alexander, married to this beautiful woman here for 33 years. Um, Overseer Emma Alexander. Yeah, we've been dating for 36, going on 37. Mm -hmm. um, three beautiful daughters. Yes. And uh, we're, I'm originally from, well, my home of record is New York City, and her home of record is uh, California. Yeah, so we got East Coast, West Coast. Yeah, so we met yeah. in the middle. So, so believe it or not, San Antonio is almost in the middle. Uh, 25 to 2,100 miles to the west is Sacramento, and 2,000 miles to the east of us is New York. So we smack dab in the middle, and that's who we are. We'll pick up the rest later. Okay, uh, Iman Abdul Muhammad. Peace be upon you. My name is Abdul Rahim Muhammad, and I am originally from the South Bronx. I'm now an honorary Texan, and I'm known more as a poet these days than a 25-year retiree from New York, New York State Department of Corrections. One poem that I think is appropriate, and perhaps it'll uh, connect later on, but the poem is simply entitled Skin. And to, uh, to a rhythm that basically goes, skin, it's only skin. It is not you, it's what you're in. It has no power, it can't protect you. If you don't shower, we'll soon detect you. It rubs right off, you don't even have to scrub. And if you take a bath, you'll leave a ring around the tub of your skin. It's only skin. It's not you, it's what you're in. Whether you got a dark one or a light one, if it fits on your body, you got the right one. It's only skin, it's just skin. It's not who we are, it's what we are in. That's it, thank you. And Brother Young, mm -hmm. he said he was on, uh, honorary or honorary? Honorary. I think he was honorary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Omar Shakur. Yes, thank you. I begin with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. We praise God. We thank him. He is the Lord, keeper, sustainer of all the worlds. Also, I greet you in peace, and I want to thank you for this opportunity. Just a little bit about myself. I am one of the local leaders. My title is Imam here in San Antonio of Mesjid Bilal, and I, do, I too also do prison ministry. But as far as my background, family background, I did grow up primarily in a two family household until my late teenage years. Then my parents did split. So I am also the product of divorced parents. But as far as myself, I've been married to my wife Zarina for 42 years. We have three children, five grandchildren and one on the way. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, Melissa. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Monroe, and um, I work in the local public relations uh, field here at Northwest Vista College. Uh, my brother-in-law is Michael Young, and uh, for the context of this conversation, um, I'm uh, um, multiracial, so I'm Black and I'm Mexican, and I've been married to Mike's brother, Maurice Young, for about 20 years now, 20 long years, and uh, we have two beautiful children, MJ, who is 15, I keep forgetting their ages, and Mina, who is nine, and they're about to go crazy in this ice storm, can't go anywhere. And uh, um, so it's been a, a crazy last several days, but I'm glad to be here um, on this panel discussion and discussing this very important topic. So thank you. Uh, Stefan? Yeah, my name is Stefan Black. Um, I'm the president of uh, Brothers Investment Club San Antonio, and I'm also the president of the National African American Gun Association San Antonio chapter here in San Antonio. I'm a friend of Michael Young. He's a treasurer of our uh, investment club uh, here in San Antonio, and I'm a divorced father of three. I'm originally from Reading, Pennsylvania. That's outside of Philadelphia. So uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm blessed to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Amber and can't see your last name there. Amber. Yes. Yeah. So we're uh, we are Cody and Amber Maduka. Um, we both live in Kansas City now. I'm originally from Arlington, Texas. Um, Amber from San Antonio. Um, I actually was I was born and raised in Arlington, but I'm a first generation um, a Nigerian. So my parents are both from Nigeria. You wouldn't you wouldn't mm -hmm. think my skin color everyone's like you're so light though um my mom was really fair um but no um been here in obviously uh you know kansas for the past four or five years um and my upbringing i was super thankful for what my parents did in coming over to the united states you know because if you've ever been to a Niger uh, nigeria or a third world country uh it is uh it's very corrupt you know and there's uh there's things you see there that you just you would never even believe happen in this world and so I'm just thankful for the opportunity we have in this call, but also just being able to be here in America and what we're, you know, Amber and I are pursuing here is the ability to live out, you know, free lifestyles because we're in an uh, actual country that allows for us to have that availability, so. And then I, my background is I'm one of seven. Um, my mom's white and my dad's black. So we have a lot of good conversations in the household. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Brother Young, I forgot to mention that, um, I'm first generation West Indian. My Both my parents from the island of St. Vincent, but I was born and raised in England. Well, partly raised in England. So I, I, was, I was British West Indian until I was 16, went to New York City and I became African-American in eight hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, across the Latin. So that's, that's my background. <laughs> well, great, as you can see, the black family is made up many, many uh, different uh, things. Okay, uh, Bishop Alexander, let me throw this one at you. Proverbs 18, 22 reminds us, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favors from the Lord. Mm. However, marriage has been a declining institution among all Americans, and this decline is even more evidence in the African-American community. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2016, only 29% of African Americans were married compared to 48% of all Americans. It was also noted that 50% of African Americans have never been married compared to 33% of all Americans. Okay, two part question. What do you think is the reason why we are seeing a decline in marriage and what can be done to change this trend? After all, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Wow. Okay. I thought we could get that to the end. Uh, <laughs> you come out with a heavy hitter. Um, man, it, there's so many factors that to thresh that out, that question. Part of that, we have to look at the uh, historically, right? We got to bring slavery into that, but uh, I don't want to linger on that because slavery disrupted the structure, mm -hmm. right? That you moved into the modern day times. Um, the family had to, you know, economics could be another part of that. Families have to move to find a job to take care. So sometimes the, the, the children and the wife was at one location while the father was working someplace else. 
and so oftentimes in a different state. Mm -hmm. So the structure started separating. But I think part of reasons that, that is predominant today is the lack of mentorship in mentoring the next generation to understand the glue that keeps us together. My parents are still married. Um, I'm 60 years old. Uh, my oldest brother is 67, 69, uh, so about 60, 68 years, 60, maybe longer. You know, the, they, they, they've been married. They, but until my mother-in-law passed away, my, on that side of the family, they were married 50 years, right? So we had models. We had people to go to when stuff got tough and, you know, as Brother Burgess say, when we had intense fellowship, there were people that modeled <laughs> what it took to stick together. Today, we don't have that type of glue. Our, our communities were not what it used to be. When I was growing up, if you did something wrong down the street, by the time you mm -hmm. got home, <laughs> people knew about it, right? It, we were a community. Today, we're, we're fragmented. Not all communities, but some. The other thing that I think that is very um, prevalent is what I call the SAM syndrome, S-A-M. Silent, absent, and missing. Some families, they're, they're together, but the father is silent. He's not taking the leadership role. Sometimes the father is absent. They, they, they're not there at the games of their children. They're not supporting the family. They, they, there's a whole bunch of other things that goes with that. And sometimes they're just missing, period. They're not, they're, they, they father children and they're no longer in their lives, right? So there's so many factors that's there. And so I heard people saying, why am I getting married? What's the use of getting married, right? There, there, there's nothing, marriage is, is fake. It's just a fudge. It's, 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 there's, so they don't see the success models. So we have to model success, right? My wife and I, work, we work hard at trying to model success. We have a program that we do yeah. twice a month. Uh, we call it a fireside chat where we talk about relationship issues and we get real. People need to see authentic, authenticity so they can know what to look for, what to hold on to. Did we have some intense fellowship? Yeah, she won them all. <laughs> she won them all. <laughs> but there's so many factors that's causing the family, the black family, and it's not just black, it's also the Hispanic family as well, that is separating. Um, and I, I, don't get, I can take it all the time. But the other part we got to look at too is we're buying into a model that says black people uh, are not going to be successful, right? There's so many things that, that, uh, that the, the data points to. But if you don't buy into that data, don't buy into right? And you set your course of success, you can be successful. Right. I, I don't want to be saying myself that, you know what, because the statistics says I'm going to be at risk. I, my environment may say I'm at risk, but I don't have to claim it. So I look for people that can help me, right? So if I want to be successful, if I've never been successful, I need to find somebody that is. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't be what I've never been, but I can find somebody who is that can help me. So I, I stop. I can go on forever. Yeah. Truly, I can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Young. Yes. I don't want to disrupt the format. I just want to understand, are each of us going to receive a question or are we allowed to weigh in on various questions? I just want to respect whatever the format is. Oh, yes, you can weigh in on uh, various questions, but each one will receive a question. Do anybody may have I any comment? other comments on that particular question? I do, if I may. OK. Picking up on what Bishop Alexander said, talking about where we are today or where we've kind of given up or we don't have models, et cetera. One of the things that hits me at the root, we cannot ignore that the family in general, and yes, the African-American family has been under attack. Mm -hmm. So what happens with this is we, we are losing our values losing our morality. When you talk about uh, Bishop Trevor's family, how long they've been married, uh, the overseer, Alexander's family, 50 years, etc., they had a different moral system. They had a different value system. And there, there was uh, shame involved 
when you weren't married and shame involved when you had children out of wedlock. Now, again, I'm not one of those people that, that say children born out of wedlock are illegitimate. No, all babies are legitimate. But I'm saying we have a value system. So the point where I'm going with this is simply this. We have been under attack. And yes, we can't erase the damage that slavery had done. And many times to be accepted, we look to our white brothers and sisters who didn't always have the best morals to model their behavior of what they seem to be able to do to be successful. And we left our value system behind and embraced theirs. And many times it took us down a rabbit hole towards destruction. So we still have an identity crisis and we still have to understand our greatness and the dignity that we have and the ancestry that we come from. I, I hope that came out all right. And, and yes, let, let, let me add to this, Brother Young. Uh, Dr. Jawanda Kunjufu, who wrote a book, mm -hmm. Adam, Where Are You? Uh, why Black Men Don't Go to Church. Why Most Black Men Don't Go to Church. He has a, a sentence which I use in other panel discussions. He says, we train our daughters and we love our sons. We train our daughters and we love our sons. And basically mm. he says, the, we give young men free fall, but we train women how to keep a home, how to cook, but we don't do that oftentimes with the men. And I think that's a good starting point there too, because you know, <laughs> some of us are here, my mother trained us how to take, I can cook, I can clean, I can iron, right? So when I married her, we married and we complete each other. He irons better than I do. Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like ironing, believe it or not, right? But my point is this. We, when you give young men a free fall and don't hold them to a value standard, right? And we hold the women to a standard that we don't hold the young men to. That sets um, a tone that says, women, you, you told a line, Men, you do what you want to, you know, but we used to have the, you sow your oats and, and, and all that good stuff. We need to change that type of value system because that value system was not the value system that we came from Africa with, but we picked it up as to, to your point, um, Imam, to your, we picked up a value system and embedded it into ours that was not part of us. Right. All right, all right. Okay, uh, Stefan, it's for you. A close examination of wealth in the United States find evidence of staggering racial disparity. Mm -hmm. At 171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family at 17,150. Gaps in wealth between black and white household reveals the effects of accumulated quality and discrimination, as well as differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to this nation's inception. With that said, uh, measure can Black families take to close the wealth gap and to build generational wealth? And, and I remember as a young child coming up, my parents told me to put, put money aside, they said, save it for a rainy day but they never did really be able to communicate to me how to build, you know, how to make your money work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, tying into that, um, I was watching a program on PBS and they were talking about the exact same question that you, you know, that you just asked. And the number one reason between the wealth gap between whites and blacks and others is that whites, a large percentage of their wealth is built into their homes. Home ownership is number one. And the second is investment in the stock market. So if you tie up those two things, that makes up 80% of white families wealth. So after understanding that, my first thing was, what can I do to maybe improve the financial literacy of black families. And I thought of why not, because most of black families, the head of it is mostly black males. So I thought of why don't I create or bring together black males to create an investment club? So I thought, so I, my first thing I did was, let me start asking my friends 
if they would like to be participants or partners in the investment club. So one of my ideas is I created, I created along with Andre, his brother Maurice and others, we have about seven members right now. We're all full partners. And our idea is to invest in the stock market, build wealth through stock investment, bonds, real estate, and other investments. And what I would like to do is take that model and push it out to other groups. And once we uh, create the model, I would like to pass that on to other organizations as far as in the church and other individuals, because I think that's the key to African-American families becoming financially independent. And that builds on education, that builds on opportunities for the future. So I think we need to start at some point, there's many areas we need to focus on, but I think one of the main most important is financial independence, and that comes from building wealth, which starts with home ownership and investment in the, the stock market at this point. So um, I think that right now, we what I was talking to Dre about is we need to identify which particular books that are important uh, that could benefit other males, put together our own uh, manuals and instructions, and then start passing that out to other black males. And then our motto is each one teach one. So what I would like to do, as I stated before, is all of us teach each other, we build and grow wealth, and then we start teaching other black males and other females also, and then other female groups or families, they can start organizing and building investment clubs and then we can start have a foundation because one of my role models was uh, the, what is it, Black Wall Street in Tulsa. They had the exact, exact same ideas. However, they weren't able to, to execute their ideas because of white supremacy and white racism. But in this day and age, I feel that we need to take up that baton and take their ideas and build upon it. So that's my answer building and investing through the stock market at this point. Anybody have anything to add? Yeah, I do. You know, one of the, if you go back historically, the black church was, was instrumental in trying to build wealth within the community. As early as 1865, there was a group of pastors, uh, Baptists and Methodist pastors that went to General Sherman and petitioned for the land. General Sherman issued a special field order, field order 15. And from Charleston all the way down to St. John River in Florida, over 400,000 acres of land was supposed to go to the black slaves, 40 acres. Not before uh, you know, we got the Emancipation Proclamation, that was already in the works. At the end of the Civil War, when Lincoln got assassinated, Johnson, President Johnson came in, he canceled that and gave that land to former rebels who declared war on <laughs> the Union and gave that land that was designated for the black slave. He gave that to people who did an insurrection, right, to keep some blacks from getting wealth. So land ownership has been it is, I, I'll go with Brother Stefan, yeah. it's instrumental. And I believe the church has to come back again. Bring that back to the table. Thank you, Brother Stefan, for doing that. But the church has to be, you need partnership, brother, and partners in, in the community. And I believe the Oman Shakur will back me up in this. We need the, the brothers to the Muslim brothers. We all can build wealth together. Yeah. And together we're stronger than we are apart. And just mm -hmm. teaching, um, our young men and young women how to invest, how to save that $25. When I was coming up, it was $25. <laughs> Whenever you get paid, put $25 away. It didn't matter, put $25 away. Mm -hmm. Everybody would tell us, you put $25 aside to save because you never know what's gonna happen. Just like Brother was Young was saying, those rainy days. Yeah. They make yes. something. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, yes, yep, I think that's key is we have to become financially independent and that allows us to have options. Then we could have options to decide what direction we want to go in the future. And we could build for the future for our families and our community. 
but you have to have finances in order to do that. And investing is the key to that, I believe. And support black owned and Mexican owned businesses. Yes, yes, we have to do that. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right, this question is for Marsha Keir. The killing of George Floyd and many other African Americans before him has led to unprecedented protests across the United States. Protesters say that without justice, there can be no peace. But the anger and pain in the U.S. is about more than wanting to stop police brutality. What else do you think is contributing to the anger and pain? And what measures can be taken to heal our nation and bridge this deep gap that divides us? Yes, sir. Thank you. That, that is a, a huge question. I just want to say real quick, though, behind uh, what Brother Stefan said, the idea of wealth, we're not going to become wealthy by saving our money. That's not how you become wealthy. A couple of the keys are the various income streams, having more than one income stream, and also the investment piece, the thing that you already said, and letting your money work for you. So one of the mm -hmm. main things that I found refreshing is that Brother Stefan and his group are saying, hey, we're going to come together in unity, sacrifice together to produce something. Unfortunately, some of us have been put against one another, and it's more dog eat dog, and it becomes a thing, well, I got mine, you got to get yours. No. When we look at immigrants, when they come over and others, you'll pick packs eight people in a one bedroom house. And they'll live together until they get their finances together and build wealth. I'm gonna get up off of that, but that I just wanted to to add that piece. Uh, I, the main point I like is the unity piece. Now back to the outrage or the feeling of of, of no peace for injustice, etc. The the thing that I, I think has happened is that a type of boldness has come about. We've been dealing with police brutality and all of these injustices for many, many years, but we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have cameras, we didn't have social media. But the thing that I think outrages most of us, and certainly it outrages me, is we don't even try to hide it anymore. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing and, and, and dare you to say something about it or dare you to do something about it. And then when we have all of the evidence that shows guilt, somehow someone gets an acquittal. This type of situation can only make a person desperate, make a person frustrated, and it can escalate to violence. I don't advocate violence, but what I'm saying is when a man or woman has their back against the wall, it's like, what else do I do? So I think that it, it is not something that happened overnight. I think it is an accumulative effect. And I think that Almighty God has given each and every human being something that says that they should be respected, something that says that their life is valuable, something that says that I should be treated with respect and dignity. And when that doesn't happen and we turn a blind eye and authorities and powers turn a blind eye to that, that just takes things to a whole nother level and it can produce in people a type of desperation where they become self-destructive and destructive to others. And the system is set up for that. So all they do is shoot their self in the foot. We have to be thinkers. We have to come up with strategies and we can't be led by our emotions and our appetites and passions. We have to think and we have to come up with good strategies and align ourselves with like-minded people. That's good, that's real good. Anybody else have anything to add to that? So um, how do you propose we do that? Um, how do you propose that we align ourselves with like-minded people? And what are your suggestions for combating this? Basically, it's white supremacy terrorism. I mean, what, what are your ideas for that? Okay. Well, thank you for that. The, the thing about this is to find like-minded people are, is not as difficult as you think. Now, what it will take is courage, though. If we study our history, many of us, maybe even myself to a certain extent, we become comfortable. 
and we're not willing to make the same sacrifices that those before us made sacrifice that even ultimately came up to their the giving of their lives in some cases. So the, the finding people, it's going to take courage. Finding people, I don't think, is going to be hard. And when we're blessed to get in various positions, we're seeing a lot of firsts. First African-American and woman of color vice president. First this, first that. We're seeing a lot of firsts. But what do we do after we get in these positions of power? We have to be smart. We have to be strategic because, again, they will shut you down if you show your hand too quick. So what I'm suggesting, brother, is that the main thing it's going to take is strategy and courage and being willing to sacrifice, feeling that it's worth that for the generations to come. And then as people of faith, we never want to take God out of it. God is always watching. And he, we, we want his blessing. We want his help and guide us to the, the best situation and solution because that's what made our foreparents successful. God is always has to be in the mix. And many times his solutions are in scripture, in his prophets and messengers. So um, that's the best that I can do with that at this time. And I hope that, that it offers something. Thank you for the question though. Let me, uh, let me also add one other piece of that. I think we also need to change the narrative. The narrative is black people are criminals. Brown people are criminals. When somebody got shot or gets shot, first thing they do is big, dig up their criminal record, right? And that justifies the assassination. It happened with George mm. Floyd. They went back and he's been arrested before in the past. We have to change the narrative, right? Just because I have a criminal record does not give you the right to assassinate me when you Correct. The, the police are supposed to arrest me. It is a judge that pronounces the sentence. The police That's is right. now the, the arrester, the, 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 the lawyers, and the executioners, right? Yeah. So change the narrative. The other thing I want to say this, and um, um, one of the narratives out there, black and black crime. Yes, it's black and black crime. It's also white and white crime, right? But we hear black and black. Dr. Eric Michael Dyson says, we have a demographic crime. You put black people in one area, guess what you're gonna have? Black crime. You put white people in one area, you have white crime. It's demographics. Not that black people are more criminal than others. And the narrative is we have to change that. We have to change the narrative. And I, I could go on, but I stop. All right. Let's go to uh, Mohammed. In 2007, when the first religious landscape study was conducted, only 12% of African-Americans said they was religiously unaffiliated. unaffiliated. Uh, by the time the 2014 landscape study was conducted, uh, that number had grown to 18%, and today it continued to chart upward. As with the general population, younger African-Americans adults are more likely than older African-Americans to be unaffiliated, three in 10, African Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 say they are unaffiliated compared with only 7% of black adults. What do you think is the reason behind this downward trend where more young African Americans adults are becoming religiously unaffiliated? This is a important question. It's one that uh, I have We lost you, brother. Well, the secure, you want to take that while, while he comes back in? No, not Say necessarily. Again? I don't, I don't, I don't. Go, go ahead, brother, man. We, we did, we lost you. Oh, okay. Am I back? Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, the church is in Harlem, right? Uh, two blocks from. Uh, Columbia University, right across the street from Adam Clayton Powell's church. But my father would take my mother to church and wait outside in the car while she and I went into church. What I learned later was that they had a falling out in terms of the pastor and my father. One of the things was the fact that my father 
was so light-skinned, he was as light as my wife. He was using his light skin to get a job that he would not have been considered for if he hadn't passed for white. But the point being that religion has taken a back seat to almost everything else in life, including materialism and greed. And we see that at every level of society. What has to happen for us is that religion has to be seen as beneficial and it has to be seen as not at odds with each other. When we look at religion, we shouldn't see ourselves as the Baptist versus the Methodist versus the Episcopalian versus uh, the Muslim, for example. And we should be able to see ourselves as following the same guidance from the same creator. That is to say that what we find of good, and I was, I was so uh, nonplussed years and years ago, I actually read the Sermon on the Mount. And I said, man, the Sermon on the Mount, that would be tough for any Muslim to live up to. The reality is, however, that truth is truth, regardless of whom or what. And when we look at what we are called to as human beings, we find that there's not any substantial difference whatsoever. We make the dividing lines as arbitrary as the dividing lines of the states. We have all of these states with dividing lines that don't exist. They're on the map, but they're not in the world. Let us see our dividing lines as African American people, as people who have and shared the same heritage. Let us see our dividing lines as arbitrary and not as important as what unites us. Anybody have anything to add to that? No, I always got like something. To, Wait, Ms. Melissa. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I work with a lot of college students. And what I find is that a lot of them sometimes don't want to be labeled as with a certain religion, but they want to be more considered like spiritual. And, you know, they, they want to see church as fun and engaging and, and you know, it's on social media and it's in their Instagram feed. And so it, I, I think, you know, churches of today almost need to reinvent themselves so that they appeal to that younger audience. And so, you know, you can get into a student's Instagram feed and their Facebook feed, and it's almost like a modern day church. I mean, social media is running everything. Like, as you can tell right now, we're on Facebook Live. So it's like, you're almost having to market yourselves and tap into a different audience. And it's not the, the church of yesterday. It's, it's a totally different world out there. M Melissa, Thank you, you for saying that, Melissa. Thank you for saying that. We have to make it relevant. We have to connect. We have to give them substance. Because again, I'm not, don't get me wrong what I'm getting ready to say, but I'm going to say it. A lot of, lot of times in my generation and before, I'm right there with you, Bishop Alexander, age-wise. Uh, there, there was more of a, a feel good. There was uh, the spiritual, the music, et cetera. And many of our people didn't have the same level of education that a lot of our younger people have. Okay, I'm saying that to say that even some of the stories that we get in religion sound like myth. It sounds like fairy tales. And yes, the miracles of God, et cetera, I'm, I'm not trying to go there, but I'm saying to a more educated person that as Imam Abdul Rahim said, are more interested in things of the world, whether it be pursuing a career, et cetera, they need something to grab them and hold them, like Melissa said, that there has to be something to engage them and, and they, that they can connect with. So thank you so much for saying that. And let me add also that I think, um, and I agree with what Melissa and the Imam just said, I think the church, I preached a message several years ago, is a church relevant or a relic, right? Hmm. Over 19 is teaching us if we're a relic, are we relevant, right? Yes, so the churches sir. that refuse to pivot, to go to the social media, you're going to become a relic. 
And it's going to be this way for a while. Don't, don't think when this thing finishes, it's going to be over. No, we got to learn how to tap into the social media and all those other things. And the other thing I, I think we have to do is uh, my, minute, my daughter yesterday shared uh, on, on our Bible study in our prayer institute that we have to become real, <laughs> okay? Authentic. Be authentic. They can see right through you. Mm -hmm. okay? The holier than thou? No. I work on the college campus too, right? So I, I, I come where you are. I talk to you mm -hmm. like this. And I, I, hey, we talk. And if, 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 if I got flaws, you're going to see my flaws, mm -hmm. right? I don't try to hide them. I'm not perfect. But they can relate to you where you are. And you, when you show them how authentic you are, they show them how authentic they are then you can find that common ground. The other thing I think we really need to do, our, our churches need to be invested in social justice. The whole right. Black Lives Matter, um, whether you, wherever you are on that, being silent is a position and they can see that, mm -hmm. right? So what, 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 is, what they find interesting, what they invest in, yeah. you need to find that too. Yeah. Passion meet passion. Will we'll eventually, in, as some type of result. And I, I, I you want to say something? That's okay. Okay. So I, I know we move on to the next one. Y'all ra raise a passion in me. So yeah. I get passionate about social justice because I think we need to be, we used to be the forefront, the forerunners. The, the Dr. King, I'm looking at Imam Shakur. I love the picture you got back there. Some of my heroes are back there, but they were involved in the community. People came to listen, to get ideas. They trained organizers to go into the community. And so we need to get back to some of that passion back. Yes, sir. May I inject a thought? Sure. Absolutely. Malcolm, Malcolm Chavez said this, you can't teach what you don't know and you can't lead where you don't go. That was mm. true then and it's true today. Mm. Oh, that's good. Oh. That's good. Let me throw Amber and them in the mix. In 1958, that was before you was born, 44% of whites said they would move if a black became their next door neighbor. Today, that figure is down to 1%. In 1964, the year that the Civil Rights Act was passed, only 18% of white claimed to have friends who are black. Today, more than 85% say they do, while 87% of Black assert they have white friends. Now, these numbers reflect the racial relationship has improved between Blacks and whites. However, when we look across America, we are seeing an increase in hate crimes, unjustifiable attacks, and other unfair practices and discriminations against African Americans, as well as people of color. What message? Does African American parents tell their children about race relations in America? Hmm. That all comes back to fear. They are they fear our success. That's what that comes to. They fear that our success will eventually replace them. So it's called a backlash. That's why they feel they feel that we're threatening to their lifestyle and their dominance. That's what it's all coming down to. That's good. Hmm. Yeah. Um, fear is, I think it, fear is a plague for sure. And obviously, um, you know, you talk, talk about the Bible and the word. You're, you, he, he doesn't want us to have fear in us, right? Like, um, you know, we're supposed to have, you know, confidence, a sound mind. Um, we're supposed to have these things that are actually stimulating out of us. Um, but we sometimes lack those things because of fear. And, you know, obviously, as the word says, love casts out all of that. Um, one thing I was just going to say, I'm, you know, my parents are Nigerian, so they brought me up here first generation. I've been in Nigeria about five times, five, six times, right? Um, so I've heard the upbringing that my parents had and now seen, obviously, and been a part of the upbringing that I've had. The biggest thing my parents wanted to instill into us when we got here, um, they, if I can be honest with you, they didn't really show us so much of the history that the African-American culture had here. If I can be honest with you, like, that wasn't like the number one thing that was a blaring um, signal for us. They, they, just, they just showed us, hey, because they made it here. They were like hard work, diligent effort, and you can create your own success. You can create your own path. But one of the biggest things, I mean, my parents have ever taught me is just the ability to work hard 
and actually just go after whatever you want. And they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they didn't hold us back at all. You know, I went to school for, I went to school at the University of Tulsa, got a basketball scholarship, full ride, and I'm going to petroleum engineering, got to, you know, finish that four years with basketball, ended up going into the oil and gas industry, three years, made a hundred thousand dollar income from that, been able to actually go into other paths as far as that goes as well. Still in engineering now, me and Amber own a business outside of our jobs, being able to actually do a lot of things that y'all are talking about, sacrifice and find people who actually have what we want and create a um, legacy that we're hopefully wanting to leave behind for our kids. Like all of that was stimulated from the work ethic that my parents put in me and Amber for sure as well. You, you know, obviously another Robinson family, um, hard workers as well, but people who have passion and people who go after uh, what they want and they get it because of that. And I was going to say, um, it's interesting how you use like the statistics of like, oh, there's an increase in um, white neighborhoods or black neighborhoods and just kind of like, I don't know, them kind of like moving out or doing something different. I don't think there's an increase. I think it's just more so we have technology. So you're seeing it more right. or mm. we're younger, like we're talking about it more instead of just hiding behind closed doors and not saying anything. I think there's just more discussion that's happening. So it seems like there's an increase when really this has been going on the whole time. We're just now speaking on it. And um, I know like for us, like personally, like we used to live on the black side of town, but we obviously became more wealthy and we moved to the white side of town and like, there goes the neighborhood type mentality started happening and you see houses being sold and things like that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, everybody's leaving. Like what happened? And it's like, oh, the black kids moved in. Like we need to change neighborhoods or they found us or something like that. So um, it's just been interesting, yeah. kind of like the difference, seeing the difference because even with my my two, there's seven of us. So like the first five is like one generation. And then the last two, they get to see both sides. So we used to live on the black side. And then now we're on the white side um, where there's a lot more wealth there and um, just the difference in mentality and things they, they don't really understand um, has something that we kind of like the older generation has kind of taught them like, just because they say you're they're your friend they're not really your friend like you know like they're looking they they already know you before you even walk in the door why it's like two black people in the school so they already know you they're like they're like okay let me be friends with them so i can get this or let me be friends with them so because they are connected mm. with this or something like that so just the shift in mentality and like obviously trying to keep our like our younger sisters okay we get it. There's a difference in colors. However, you don't have to treat them differently just because they're a different color. But at the same time, you need to have a, your guard up because they're, they don't, they don't, they don't always have your best interests. So like us going to have a slumber party with our friends back in the day, is not the same as you going to your friends now who's like on the white side of town. It's not the same. So, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and just, and just being able to like have, like see this firsthand as well, like from her family is actually, it's, it's so true, like literally, I mean, I, I met her when y'all were in like the, the like the black neighborhood and then they transitioned <laughs> um, and you can definitely see that. And just to kind of like, add, you know, put a final point to your question, I think it's a mindset. And I think a lot of the, the, the mindset that we need to have as a community comes from the association that we have. Like this type of, this type of group or this type of Zoom call or this type of, um, you know, instance that we're having right now, this isn't being had by young individuals like our age, if I could be honest with you. Like right now, Friday night, seven o'clock, they're not doing they're not this. They're, they're, not, they're not thinking about that at all. They're, th they're thinking about going out. They're thinking about being able to have fun, do, do whatever they can do to stimulate their mind because they're not stimulated currently in what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And for us, we were just like, mm -hmm. we had to find an association, people who could actually give us direction in a mindset to be able to think properly so we didn't allow for things that really can cause some back honestly some some just a um what does it say in the word when you're um when you're like you, you're removed like you're pushed back like you um i can't remember can't remember the word but you're pushed back because of the yeah the resistance that you're getting you're not able to overcome it because you don't know how to and you don't have the direction for it because there's no examples and no leaders in your life directly you know hanging on what um pastor alexander you were talking about as far as mentorship goes so let me, All right. Let me pick it back real quick, Brother Andre. Okay. Um, I believe um, Frederick Douglass said this, and I'm paraphrasing. You don't have to fight for everything, but everything you get, you got to fight for. Right? So it's mm. not going to be handed to you. Not all the time. So 
integrating neighborhood. And, and there's some people, if we're if we honest, in both sides of the camp, don't believe in interracial marriages, right? I, I, my my, my uh, youngest daughter is, is dating in an in a, uh, interracial relationship and they go to restaurants and they get the looks, yes, they do. right? They get the looks. And some people don't, from both sides, some people don't believe in that. But you're talking about integrating um, uh, neighborhoods. Let's go a little bit further. I think Melissa can help me on this. In education, in higher ed, I, oftentimes I walk into settings and I look in the room, immediately when I walk in that room, I can spot three or four that look like me. Sometimes I am the only one. And I found if I need to get information, when I walk in that room, for some reason, I'm a threat. I don't know why, mm. right? And information get withheld. But if you find the right person, for whatever reason, they want to share information or to bring you along with that. Listen, I will, I, I used to call myself, I will be your, I will dummy down to get the information I need. So I can, because sometimes they want to give you information so they can have something on you. Give it to me. Once I get it, I now own it, right? But mm -hmm. in high ed, sometimes there's a competitive nature. Yeah. A but a lot of times. But as soon as a person of color walks in there, the playing field, the rules change and they don't give you the playing book. So you got to learn how to navigate the, the rules. And sometimes you got to buddy up to get the rule book. And once you get the rule book, then you then you then you have some power. Melissa. Well, I think, yeah, I was going to say that that's mainly because in most of our education systems, racism is, is systemic. Yeah. So, um, you know, unless you're going to a HBCU, um, in the majority of the colleges and universities, you know, in the United States, you're, if there's a, a black student or a black empo employee, there's, you're probably only be one or two or a handful at, in that classroom or, or in that um, institution. And that's why it's important that, that we um, be not afraid and lead others from behind us and, and you know, be the first one to go through that door, be the first one to lead. You know, if it wasn't for some of our leaders like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, then we wouldn't be where we are today with some of the successes we had on the, you know, like Kamala Harris. So we need to break down those barriers, not be afraid and show others that, hey, you can be the next vice president of this college. You can be the next uh, leader of this student association. You can be the next president of the Brothers Investment Club or whatever it is. So that, you know, that's how we gain success and that's how we get ahead. Cause it's gonna be like that probably for the next 10 or 20 years. Oh, yeah. And we have to break the door down at some point and we have to show our children and teach our children. You may be the only one black student in this class but that's all right because you have to break down that door and you have to be successful so you can bring your other colleagues, your other students with you. Okay, okay. This so, is Cody, the, uh, Cody, no, I just want to say this to Co Cody, right? Cody, what, what's your wife's name? Amber. Cody and Amber, I just want to uh, applaud you both. I'm impressed with your intellect, uh, impressed with the fact how serious-minded you are, like you said people of your age are thinking about something else. I, I just want to push you all up. Thank you so much for the example you set and all the best to both of you. Right, right. Most definitely, most definitely. Okay, this is the last question. We're coming up on the hour. Melissa, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, one can either be for it or against it. The movement recently has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and the American Civil Liberty Union reported that 93% of the Black Lives Matter demonstration are peaceful. If Black Lives Matter is fighting for the equal rights of all Black people, why is it difficult for people to get behind? And how do we as Black families help one another to keep the momentum going? Mm. So I think the important thing that you said right there is that 93% of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations are peaceful. And I think that um, information is what we need to get out to our children and the community because there's so much disinformation, misinformation out there. And people, when they get on social media, they want to read anything they see without even doing a um, fact check. You know, who is the source? Where is it coming from? 
Um, they just take images off the internet and it could be, you know, ext extremely right wing, extremely left, whatever. But the facts matter. And facts matter in that 93% of demonstrations from the Black Lives Matter movement are peaceful. And that not only that, that um, the movement has been up for Sweden's top human rights award, which is similar to the Nobel Peace Prize. And people are, they want to just um, stereotype the Black Lives Matter movement. They want to believe anything. And we need to teach our communities that it's for social justice it's for um, equal rights. Um, actually, it was started by a gay black woman um, in, from California. And um, she wanted to uh, bring more awareness just about all the killings happening to young black men. And I think that is extremely important, just the history behind it and what it stands for and not the misinformation. Um, I know, uh, at the college I work for, we have started the Black Lives Matter um, Association, and we have been getting some black um, backlash, backlash actually, um, in terms of well, it's political. Um, that's a violent organization, and we've actually been doing a whole lot of educating just to get some of our colleagues to join, just to get some of our uh, non-black colleagues to join, and we probably have more. Um, non-black people who are part of this organization than we do some of our black colleagues which is kind of interesting because some of our black employees don't want to be labeled as well I'm a part of the the Black Lives Matter movement so it's not just misinformation on the white side it's also misinformation on the black side the you know, Hispanic side you know Asian side as well so I think just information is key and facts matter you know that's extremely important you yeah. have anything else to add we close out yeah I think I, I the think thing that I would add to that the thing that I would add to that to our children etc it is an opportunity for a teachable moment see a lot of times what we want to do is just stay in our present uh, sweep things under the rug it's an opportunity you have to take our children all the way back you have to take them back so that they understand the thought process and how we got where we are today why maybe their skin color is devalued, et cetera. So simply take that opportunity of a teachable moment. And I mean a comprehensible teachable moment. Anybody else? Yeah, Brother Stefan was gonna say something I'll say after him. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I believe that Dr. King also used the youth because a lot of the older yeah. the population did not wanna be associated with the movement because of fear of losing their job or their status in the community. So a Black Lives Matter is more of a youth movement, but I think that the okay. churches and other black organizations need to get behind it because it's very important for the future of the black community. I fully support Black Lives Matter myself. I think they're doing a great job. Let me say that there's a difference between Black Lives Movement and the black life participants, right? Hmm. Some people show up to a rally to participate and then they go off and see the riots and everything else. But 93% of the, the protests have been peaceful. That's the movement. But the media is shining on the participants, which takes away from the movement. And, the, and it, there's a movement and a moment, right? Oftentimes there's a moment and people show up when that moment's gone, they're gone. But the movement keeps moving. And so I, I said it earlier on, I believe that the church has a role to play in coming along the move, the movement, not the moment. We show up at the moment and the moment's gone and we're gone. But we have to invest for the long haul. We, right. I, I, I know some people who come against me because I support Black Lives Matter, right? Oh, you're the church and that. Why can't the church do this? Dr. King did it, right? Yeah. Nelson Mandela does it, did it. So we can be social justice minded as well as spiritual minded. And for me, that's not a conflict. Yeah. Fact, if I, we go back and study scripture, we saw the effect of people who were social justice minded speak, speaking truth to power. Right. And we have yeah. to be able to speak truth to power if we're gonna make a difference. Now, let me just say this. I know we're coming to an end. And I, but I want to put this out there. 
Brother, Brother Young, yes. get, get ready. You go, you're about to get some on your plate. Yes. Um, we, we have Black History Month um, once a year. Yeah. Once a year. I, I believe I'm Black all year round. Just want to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> believe it or not, because of COVID, but my busiest time of the year getting a speaking engagement is February, right? I'm Black on March. I'm Black in May. You know, mm -hmm. But I don't think we have to wait till next year right. to do this. So I think Brother Young, here's your marching orders. Um, once a quarter, yeah. once a quarter, bring us back together I think that would to, be to talk about this. Let's put some things together. I'd like to hear more about this investment piece. Yes. I want to hear more about what Cody and Amber's doing. Yeah. I wanted the young people to come to the to the table. Um, you know, listen, we're not gonna be here forever. <laughs> and we, we, we were just talking about this with my daughter. We need a younger generation to come to the table. Let me just say this, and I'm I'm part of the reason I think we need to bring the NAACP and the Black Lives Matters movement together. The NAACP has the knowledge and the experience of knowing how to come to the table and maneuver. Yeah, they have the playbook. Yeah. Cody, you are right. Uh, well, I think Stefan said it. The younger, the uh, Black Lives Matter have the youth. They have the energy. Let's bring the to both of them to the table, right? And learn from one another. And I believe that we can do some major, major changes in our society. Because of the time, I won't read the entire poem. This is one of Imam Omar's favorite poems. It's one of Reverend Trevor's favorite poems. But because of the fact that the land, the lander landed on Mars today, hmm. going back to Hidden Figures, yes. powerful film, and looking at where we are. The poem's entitled A Very Human Being, but I'm just gonna read the last paragraph, which says, Life on other worlds may seem impossible to find, but here on earth to recognize a human heart and mind is harder still for those who think that just a certain kind of people qualify with all the rest somewhere behind. The irony is great for those who claim superiority. Denying others birthright bears their own inferiority. Change the sorry state of mind disguised as a human condition and remake the world in human form and change our minds is every single human being's mission. Amen. Amen. That was good. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, he's got a book, you know, and we need to promote his book, a book of poems. Not now. Not now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I thank you all for taking time out to do this. This has been very, very helpful. Um, you have definitely a way some awareness and um, it's been good and I look forward to maybe like I said uh, doing this again turn it over to uh, the bishop and overseer for closing remarks and comments and take us out for prayer all right this has been just phenomenal thank you all so much for being on each and every one of you you have made an impact there are so many different questions in the chat we did not get an opportunity to get to but brother young uh, our next one since we're doing it quarterly we can maybe get them um as they have their their topics then we can kind of address some of the questions that are in the chat as well you guys mm -hmm. just brought a wealth of knowledge a lot of things that are are exciting one of the questions and i'm gonna uh, move on stefan they were asking about you as far as how young can they be a part of that i saw somebody say Oh, I would like my son to be a part of that group because he's a young black male learning how to do that. So we definitely would like this same panel to come back because there are some questions that have been, you whet the appetite. And so you, we have just did a wonderful um, advertisement. So you know what, Woo! We, hey, they got some stuff for us. So we want to come back <laughs> next time. So get ready, um, Brother Young, and let us know the date and time. So please, um, be, be ready to hear from him because we would love to for us to gather again. Again, I just say thank you, Brother Young. You're doing an awesome job. You go from level to level each year, and you are continuing to continuing to take True Vine higher. And we truly mm -hmm. appreciate you. Amen. You know, uh, Brother Young, I, I I can say this, and she stole my thunder. Um, when when we put the Black History Month in your hand several years ago, 
you took it, you took it to heart, yeah. you organized, you put forth some wonderful panel discussions and presentations. Um, and so you've done an outstanding job. And I know we just put some more on your plate. Now they're saying that you gotta be a, an organizer, bring that together every quarter. Uh, but I think it's needed. It it's so needed. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to each of the panelists that's there. Um, again, we didn't get to all of the questions, but we got them on the chat on the post and we can um, address some of those. Thank you to Imam uh, Shakir and my, my good friend, Imam Abdul Rahim, and to um, Stefan, Melissa, uh, Amber and Cody. Man, I just remember the Y'all are still newlyweds. <laughs> the ink is still drying. Uh, I remember still being attending your wedding. Yeah. But thank you all so much. Um, I believe thank you, we, Bishop Alexander. Thank, thank you, you Bishop. Thank you. Thank we you need much. the voices, the young and the old, as the scripture says, coming together. Um, Melissa, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and I, we need, uh, I, I have three daughters, right? So I, I'm passionate about women coming to the table and not being in a back seat. Can't be a backseat. Mm -hmm. I'm married to her, yeah. uh, you know, and she's a she's dynamic all by herself. And it's not about out, out doing one another. Right. It's coming to the table, complimenting each other. So mm -hmm. thank each of you for the the, the wonderful wealth yeah, of know. information that you you presented today. And I know there's more in you, yeah. but we didn't get the chance to pull it out. Yeah. But over the next um, months or so, we, we'll get that there. And brothers, uh, Imam Shakur, we talked about bridging that gap year, a couple months, well, a couple of years ago when we had break, uh, lunch together. You know, we, we, we go on panels, but we don't bring our churches and our masters together. This could be a way yes, to sir. bring us together and to start that dialogue. You know, we, it's not a competition. We're about building right. our community. And I know you're about building community as well. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Awesome. I welcome that. Yeah, and, and so I'm going to um, um, ask you, sir, to close us out in prayer in your tradition. You're asking me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We pray with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, by the token of time through the ages. Verily, the human being is at a loss, except such as have faith and do righteous deeds and exhort one another to the mutual teachings of truth, patience, and constancy. Our Lord, please don't allow our hearts to deviate now that you've guided them aright. We pray for a special mercy from thine own presence, for you are the grantor of bounties without measure. Amen. 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 Thank you. We're going to go off live. And thank you for those of you tuning in on Facebook Live. Don't forget to share and like this page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.